tonight, a tragic crash ends six young lives in Ontario. As a parent myself, I don't know how you heal from this. The devastated community and tributes to one of the victims. Christia. Yes. What the f are you doing in Alberta? The growing concern about security and harassment after Christopher Freeland is accosted in Alberta. There's a rage machine that keeps turning this out. Crowded lecture halls, packed parties, campus life is back. Will COVID come with it? Sometimes like I'll feel like I want a mask just to be a little more comfortable. An infectious disease doc weighs in on the right approach for 2022. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. On this final weekend of August, when many are enjoying what's left of summer, a community in Ontario is instead grappling with enormous loss after six people were killed in a single vehicle crash. Police in the city of Barrie confirming today that six victims were found at a crash site early this morning. It's believed they were all in their early 20s and had been reported missing Saturday night. Dale Manukduk is in Barrie tonight with what's known about the crash and the impact on the community. Police say an officer discovered the scene around 2 a.m. Sunday on a rural stretch of road southwest of downtown Barrie. It's believed that the occupants of that vehicle were the persons that were reported as missing the night before on Saturday night. Uh, at this point, the investigation remains ongoing. The group reported missing around 8 p.m. Saturday were four men and two women, all in their early 20s. Police have not confirmed the names and ages of the victims. However, the Barrie Minor Lacrosse Association confirmed to CBC News that one of the young men killed was Luke West, a longtime member of the Barrie Bombers. They called him one of their most beloved players and coaches. In a statement, they wrote, Few have ever worked harder in Bomber Blue. Few can claim to have lifted us so high. We love you, we miss you, and we are grateful for the time we had with you. Rest in peace, number 11. Go Lukey. Uh, as a parent myself, it's about the worst news you can imagine. Barry's Mayor Jeff Lehman called the crash a shocking and horrible tragedy in his community. The Victim Services Unit with the Barry Police are assisting the families now. That's what they do in situations like this, uh, connecting them in, in, in many cases to counselling or other support that will be needed over the, the longer term, I'm sure. Ontario Premier Doug Ford paid his respects on social media. On behalf of all Ontarians, I want to extend my deepest condolences to the loved ones of these six young individuals. We are holding you all in our hearts during this time of unspeakable pain. And Dale, you've been out near the scene of the crash this afternoon. What's been happening there? Yeah, Ian, throughout the afternoon and evening, about a handful of people have pulled over on the shoulder of Country Road 27, where I am trying to catch a glimpse of what's happening behind me. But as you can see, there's been a police car stationed there for much of the day. Police say that this will be a complex investigation and won't speculate about the cause of the crash. We're also still waiting on confirmation of the victims' identities. But obviously, Ian, a very difficult day for their families and the community of Barrie. Yeah. Gilman Uptuck in Barrie, Ontario. Thanks. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau weighed in today on that video showing the Deputy Prime Minister being verbally attacked by a man in Alberta. He called what happened to Christia Freeland extremely disturbing. Brian Patrick Jones shows us the video, the reaction, and what's known about the man responsible. I need to speak to somebody in charge here. The man made it clear who he was looking for. Christia! What are you doing in Alberta? You f***ing traitor, f***ing bitch! Get the f*** out of this province! You don't belong here. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau condemned the harassment. Threats, violence, intimidation of any kind are always unacceptable. And this kind of cowardly behaviour threatens and undermines our democracy. It looks like the event was planned. This anti-hate uh, expert says the man in the video subscribes to anti-government conspiracies and COVID-19 misinformation. He also took part in events supportive of the Freedom Convoy. There's a rage machine that keeps turning this out, essentially, and, and presents the political leaders or politicians in general as the enemy. We're seeing increasingly uh, people in public life, people in positions of responsibility, particularly women, uh, racialized Canadians, uh, people of uh, minority uh, or uh, different uh, community groups uh, being targeted. 
politicians denounced the attack and posted messages of support for Freeland, including several high-level conservatives. We have to put an end to it and demand that everybody uh, treat other Canadians uh, with respect uh, when we debate political ideas. It is not okay. We need protection, especially for some of the, you know, our senior most recognized ministers. Former cabinet minister Catherine McKenna often had to beef up her security after facing threats. And there have been other recent examples. You turn your back on the people! Protesters screamed at NDP leader Jagmeet Singh at an event in May, and the prime minister was hit by gravel while campaigning last year. Targeted. This expert um, says so beefing up security and, and could resources. be a challenge. Uh, these resources need to come from somewhere, and the RCMP is already short-staffed. Freeland's office wouldn't comment on her security. She says she'll continue to visit the province. Alberta's RCMP wouldn't confirm an investigation. Ryan Patrick Jones, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Vancouver have released video showing the assault of a man following Pride events earlier in the summer, and they say that they're investigating it as a possible hate crime. This comes as Ottawa unveiled a new plan to support LGBTQ communities across the country. As Susanna De Silva explains, advocates say it's needed now more than ever. And a warning, the video you're about to see is disturbing. A toss of a slushy, just the beginning of a cruel assault on Vancouver's commercial drive. Police say the 42-year-old man was beaten after an argument with another man inside a convenience store, but believe there is another reason for the violence. And we do believe that it was motivated by hate. This happened during Pride Week, and um, I understand that the suspects did utter some homophobic threats to the victim. The attack happened here July 31st. Police say hoping to protect the victim, they tried to identify the suspects without releasing the tape. His physical injuries may have been minor, but obviously there's a lot of uh, emotional trauma that comes with this. The most recent numbers from Statistics Canada showed a 64% increase in hate crimes last year, targeting people for their sexual identity. Build a future where everyone in Canada is truly free to be who they are and love whom they love. Part of the reason the federal government says it unveiled an election-promised action plan worth $100 million over five years, $75 million of that for community groups, plus money for data collection and an awareness campaign. Making sure we are empowering folks on the ground, community leaders like so many gathered here today, uh, to step up and give that support is a far better thing than having to do it from government. Welcome news, say some advocates. And so these kind of investments are critical in terms of being able to respond to what we see is like a growing uh, lack of tolerance. Others would have liked to have seen more. Um, yeah, I think the idea of having uh, a 2S LGBTQI plus action plan is an important step. Not many countries in the world have them. The, the plan should have been more concrete. In this latest act of violence, police are asking anyone who recognizes the alleged attackers and those who came to help to contact them. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Quebec's 43rd general election campaign is now underway. Despite a healthy lead in the polls, CAQ leader Francois Legault says he's leaving nothing to chance. If there's one thing I learned during the pandemic is to be humble because things change very fast. Legault kicked off his campaign in Quebec City this morning, as did Liberal leader Dominique Anglade and Conservative Party leader Eric Duhem. La passe clima. Parti Québécois leader Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon launched his bid in Montreal, while the joint leaders of Quebec Solidaire kicked off their campaign in Sherbrooke. Quebecers go to the polls October 3rd. Legault starts his campaign in a strong position with many impressed by his handling of the pandemic and steering Quebec politics away from old debates, though not everyone wants to see him get a second term. Here's Alison Northcott. This farm in Laval, north of Montreal, sits in a riding that could change hands in this election. Stéphanie Bertrand, who works in long-term care, says the pandemic is still a major issue for her, and she's impressed with how François Legault has handled it. She says she's already made her choice to support his party again. Legault is aiming for a second term as premier amid a shift in Quebec's electoral politics. From an old politics in Quebec or organized around sovereignty and federalism towards kind of like new and normal politics, discussing 
uh, social and economic programs more in terms of left and right. Legault has pushed a nationalist agenda over a sovereignist one, passing controversial legislation like the secularism law and Bill 96 to strengthen the French language. He's popular among many Quebecers. They have the benediction of everybody, you know, to make some move. But not all of them. I think it's time uh, someone goes. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Antoine Safai moved here from Syria seven years ago and is studying to be a pharmacist. I'm not a big fan of uh, the bill that has been passed recently. I'm not really like in full committed to CAQ uh, and their ideology. I'd rather like, you know, I'm more inclined towards the liberal side. Experts say part of Legault's advantage has been a lack of visibility of opposition parties during the pandemic, with some leaders Quebecers just don't know yet. They were not in front of the news all the time while Monsieur Legault was on the news uh, making press conferences every single day. There are five main parties now jostling for seats. The competition for attention and recognition remains. But voter turnout has been declining in Quebec. And with the CAQ starting off this campaign ahead in the polls, that slide could continue. Many voters think that, well, the election's won already. Uh, I don't have to go ahead and vote anymore. With a campaign now officially underway, Quebecers have five weeks to make their choices. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Laval. Sources at CTV News has revealed a story that was supposed to air on Wednesday night didn't after management gave specific feedback around what could not be included in it. As Ithil Musa explains, some say it raises serious concerns about journalistic interference. The CTV national news story was about Dove's Keep the Grey campaign. Lisa Laflamme wasn't named in the campaign, but many have linked it to her ouster as anchor of CTV national news. There were reports in the media her dismissal may have been tied to her decision to stop dyeing her hair during the pandemic. Several sources at CTV told CBC News Richard Gray, the company's acting vice president of news, instructed journalists not to include images or video of La Flamme. Gray was recently appointed to replace Michael Melling, who is on leave pending the outcome of a workplace review. Journalists pushed back, and the story didn't air. Ultimately, journalistic independence is, is, our, is our North Star, you know, and this is this strikes at, you know, the currency that we trade in, which is trust, truth, and transparency. The Canadian Association of Journalists says several CTV employees reached out to the organization about their management's potential infringement on editorial freedom. CTV sources say it's not unusual for bosses in newsrooms to give feedback on stories, but the direction not to include images or video of La Flamme crossed the line. They were coming to the CAJ with some hope for leadership, um, for follow-up and to ensure that, you know, that this, that this, this issue gets the, the attention and the oxygen and the spotlight that, that it needs in order to, you know, be, be considered and, and taken seriously. A conversation about ageism and women going grey. CTV eventually aired the story on Thursday after companies like Wendy's unveiled similar marketing campaigns, this time with images and clips of La Flamme. In a statement to CBC News, CTV's parent company Bell Media said all editorial decisions have been made by editorial leaders and the company remains committed to upholding the principles of journalistic independence and integrity. The company CEO also says La Flamme's departure is not related to her age, gender or grey hair. Instead, it reflects the massive changes to traditional broadcasting in Canada. Ethel, the backlash over Lisa La Flamme's departure from CTV News continues to grow this weekend. Yes, in Saturday's Globe and Mail, dozens of prominent Canadians, including artists, journalists, civil rights activists and politicians, published an open letter calling on Bell Canada to make things right. In the two-page advertisement, they said Bell Media's decision to remove La Flamme in the very prime of her career has had a profound impact. The letter was signed by more than 70 people, including singer Anne Murray and former Prime Minister Kim Campbell. All right, Ithil, thank you. You're welcome. There are signs tonight violence has abated for now in Libya's capital, a day after intense fighting that killed more than 30 people. 
charred cars and bullet holes scarred the city after its worst fighting in two years. Clashes broke out early Saturday between militias loyal to the government and groups allied with a rival administration. India has demolished these two residential towers yet to be occupied. It follows a decade-long court battle that found builders had colluded with officials to violate several regulations. The 100-meter towers are the tallest structures ever pulled down in the country. Rescue operations continue in Pakistan amid catastrophic flooding. The number of dead continued to climb this weekend. And as Kyle Bax explains, relief efforts are strained in a country already struggling financially. A young boy clinging to a few rocks, pulled up by rope and taken to safety. A dramatic rescue, one of many, as helicopters airlift hundreds in northern Pakistan. Already more than a thousand are dead, including more than 300 children. In the last 24 hours alone, at least 119 people were killed. I haven't seen any, any uh, destruction or devastation of this scale. Inside this temporary shelter, flood victims scramble to get their hands on food and other supplies. Floods are common in Pakistan, but not to this level of devastation. Officials describe it as a climate catastrophe. This man says it's been raining for more than a week. His house has collapsed and he could not save anything from it. Aid workers are trying to bring in supplies by truck and boat, but many roads and bridges are washed out. Some countries are stepping up to help, including Canada. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says, like many Canadians across the country, he's thinking of everyone affected by the devastating flooding in Pakistan. Canada is providing support through the United Nations Central Emergency Response Fund and the Red Cross. Still, Pakistan's Prime Minister says more is needed, saying those blessed with wealth to come forward and hold the hand of those suffering in this difficult time. Pakistan is trying to avoid a financial collapse, but the country says it's been able to secure more loans and could receive more financing from the International Monetary Fund in the coming days. In the meantime, monsoon downpours and roaring floodwaters continue to pound the country. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Washington. Parts of central Mississippi are bracing for flooding tonight. Get out now. Get out as soon as possible. Record-setting rainfall has begun submerging streets. The Pearl River is expected to crest tonight or tomorrow. Up to 150 homes could be affected. The governor declared a state of emergency in some areas and says search and rescue teams are standing by. Tomorrow is expected to be a milestone day for space travel. After years of planning and months of preparation, the Artemis One mission is now just hours from launch, using the most powerful rocket NASA has ever built. The ultimate goal? returning humans to the moon more than 50 years after the Apollo missions. And here's a look at the launch site in Cape Canaveral tonight. Tomorrow's liftoff is scheduled for just after 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Earlier today, we spoke to CBC News science reporter Nicole Mortellaro about this historic mission and what NASA will be watching for most closely. What we're doing is looking at that rocket to see how it performs. You look at it, you might recognize those white boosters on the side. That, those are repurposed from the, the, from the shuttle years. And we want to see how that all, system all works together in tandem. And on the most important thing, of course, is that crew capsule, Orion, that is sitting on top. We want to see, this is going to be a 42-day mission around the moon, and we want to see how that performs. And then importantly, coming back, you're going to see the Orion capsule, that test of that heat shield. That is critical for re-entry. It is coming in at 40,000 kilometers per hour. And if the Artemis 1 mission goes as planned? Artemis 2 is next. And that will be launching sometime in 2024 or 2025. We will have a Canadian astronaut on board. And then there's Artemis 3, and that's going to be done in tandem with uh, SpaceX and their massive rocket Starship. Uh, in Artemis 2, you're going to have astronauts orbiting the moon and coming back. Artemis 3 will have boots on the ground. That's the idea, is to get astronauts on the surface of the moon once again. And this isn't just a, hey, we're going and we're touching down and coming back, collecting moon rocks. This is actually building 
a permanent presence in space. Canada is contributing to the Lunar Gateway, which is part of this overall return uh, to the moon. And on that will be Canada Arm 3. And because of that, that's why we get astronauts on, our, on the Artemis mission. And that's actually really kind of like a platform to head not just to, you know, moon as a jumping off point, but also to Mars. That is the long-term goal. And stay with CBC News tomorrow, and Nicole brings us more on the historic Artemis One mission live from Cape Canaveral. As intense shelling continues to target the Zaporizhzhia nuclear plant in Ukraine, in some other parts of the country, people are trying to rebuild. Oh, gosh. So what happened here? Up next, inside Irpin and Bucha, months after their deadly battles. Plus, university students prepare for a return to campus. Pretty much no matter what the mandates are, I'm just excited to be back on campus and have a normal year. From masks to mandates, why that new normal looks different across the country. And later, a Canadian homecoming. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. The cup, the parade, and the meaning behind this moment. We'll be right back. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. Both Ukraine and Russia are accusing each other of ongoing shelling around Europe's largest nuclear power plant this weekend. And that's heightening concern about the possibility of a nuclear disaster. Russian forces have been in control of the Zaporizhzhia plant since early in the war. But Ukraine still controls the area just across the river from the plant. Ukrainian scientists are still running its operations. The shelling is happening as negotiations take place to have a team from the International Atomic Energy Agency to visit the plant. That team would assess any damage to the facility and could arrive within days. While the war grinds on in parts of Ukraine, other communities are trying to rebuild from the wreckage of earlier battles. With the conflict now past the six-month mark, Susan Ormiston and her team visited communities near the capital of Kyiv, where people are struggling to put their lives back together, despite the risk of another Russian attack. Oh, gosh. So what happened here? This was his son's bedroom until the war ripped open the roof. His child's bed was right underneath. Luckily, Yven Ponomarenko and his family had already fled Irpin. I'm very sad. It's his room, the best place. He just finished renovating their dream apartment, now with a lot more work to do when he can find the money and the time. Can you move back here? Maybe. When all this is renewed, I don't want to take my kid back here to see all this. Yvonne and his wife had come back to collect toys and clean up. Betting Russian troops will not invade again, but they are angry. You're doing your best to have a good life, and because of Russia, for what? It's just a regular building. The fighting ravaged Irpin, near Kyiv, leaving ugly scars. As Ukrainian forces tried to push the Russians back, some apartment blocks so broken they'll be demolished. But where there's fixable damage, it's beginning. Residents starting to reclaim their lives. That earpin bridge destroyed in March with people trapped, trying to flee, is being rebuilt, a symbol of risky resilience here. Some of the darkest early days left Bucha terrorized as the Russians retreated mass killings. Andrei Kotenko tells us there were eight bodies on his street when they escaped. The Russians were getting drunk in the evenings and driving tanks and firing, he says. He shows us his daughter's home, randomly hit by tank fire, a hole right through the wall. But the family has come back to live. For now, it's safe enough to be here to fix your house. It is scary, but we don't have any other choice, says Ola. Where would we go and how? And my grandkids are here. The house was built just a year ago, mostly intact except for the one corner, their grandson's bedroom, hit a week after the family left. His daughter and son-in-law will start work on the damage Monday. We need to live, to hope for something. 
in Bucha, Father Andre invites us into his church, which became a sacred refuge during the worst days. Evil has no logic, he says, struggling to explain the atrocities. Bucha won't, it can't forget, collecting bodies for a mass burial in the churchyard. The pictures are an undeniable reminder. But Father Andre says a spirit of regrowth is beginning. Most people have the aspiration and the willpower to renew their normal lives, he says. But while Bucha and Irpin rebuild, they worry about other parts of Ukraine still under shelling. We don't want this to become a war of exhaustion. That temporary graveyard behind his church with its horrors is growing over, eventually to become a memorial. Those bodies from the churchyard have now been brought to a cemetery here in Bucha, a final resting place. But even as people here begin to resume their lives, they've dug fresh graves. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Bucha. When we come back, how Canadian universities are navigating the return to school. We have to give students the right to have a normal year. People want to interact. Infectious diseases specialist Dr. Zane Chagla breaking down the different policies and what makes sense for this moment. And later, why the future of the movie theater may mean no movies at all. In Ontario, hundreds of Western University students protested this weekend against the school's COVID booster and masking mandates. Across the country, the policies are quite varied. We spoke to some students at two universities in Toronto which have relaxed their COVID mandates. People want a mask, they can mask. Like I, sometimes like I'll feel like I want a mask just to be a little more comfortable. My mother is immunocompromised and so is my sister, so I do highly believe in COVID mandates. I think it's good that it's like relaxing its policies because like the city is as well and it's kind of matching how we're doing outside of the school. Pretty much no matter what the mandates are, I'm just excited to be back on campus and have a normal year. Well, for some analysis on all of this, let's bring in Dr. Zane Chagla, an infectious diseases specialist and an associate professor of medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton. And Dr. Chagla, we're seeing different approaches from different universities. And let's start with McMaster. It's leaving decisions up to students and staff. So I saw some tweets from, from Mac, and one of them says, you know, masking is strongly encouraged indoors, but not mandated. Vaccinations aren't mandated, but people are encouraged to keep up to date. Uh, why do you support that approach? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it goes with what the evidence shows. We want things to be safe, but we, we recognize that, you know, particularly vaccinations are a personal risk modifier. We have lost with Omicron a lot of the ability for vaccines to prevent infection. Uh, two doses, uh, really, you know, uh, 20 weeks after that second dose, the, the protection against infection is lost. Even three doses out of UK, Israel, Singapore, uh, that, that a lot of the protection against infection is lost by three, three, uh, three to four months. And so, you know, when we have that in mind, uh, there's no way you can vaccinate people to a point where they're going to be preventing transmission. We've seen that around the world. And I think you have to add to the fact that this last year, a lot of people have had COVID. 60% of the population that would be going to university, 18 to 29 year olds, have had COVID. And so, you know, when you add that on, the fact that some of them are vaccinated, some of them may not be vaccinated, some of them may have two doses. When we see the data showing that their protection against severe disease is very high, regardless of which one of those boxes they fit in, you know, I think you start taking away the role of mandates, especially in vaccination, and you have to start thinking about the harms of that approach, which aren't minimal in that sense. So let's talk about that. What are some of the harms? Yeah, look, number one, uh, you know, vaccines are incredibly safe, but there is side effects, you know, particularly in 18 to 25 year olds in men. That is the highest described risk group of myocarditis. Now, it's not a high risk. It's about one in 9,000 to one in 16,000 on the booster dose based on some Israeli data. But again, you know, if you have a young man who has two doses of vaccine plus an, a prior infection, who is no different than having three doses of vaccine, you know, and now you're asking them to take an extra risk on top of that, you know, we do have to think about that. Add to that, you know, as public health, 
we're going to need people on our side. We have other diseases that are circulating, like meningococcus in Toronto. We'll need people uh, when things happen, and we'll need people's trust when things happen. The more we push people away, the less likely they're going to come back. And I think the third point is the booster rate is not the same in every population. We see some of the lowest income communities, some of the most racialized communities, even in London, Ontario, uh, that have booster rates that are less than a third in the 18 to 29 year old population. Uh, and so when you think about the people that are gonna be excluded from coming to school, unless they make that decision, you know, we may start pushing people out of higher level education at the last minute, which then has you know, other implications for their benefits to, to jobs, the benefits to, to their formative experience in postgraduate education and post-secondary education, uh, and many other factors in that sense. You mentioned London, of course, uh, the university there, the big one, Western, um, has taken a different approach than McMaster, and it is mandating boosters, it is mandating masking. So you've talked a lot about boosters, but let me, let me ask you about masking, because I'll bet you some people watching now have this question, What's the harm in that? Like, if masking helps, why not just mandate it in a university classroom? Yeah, look, I, I don't disagree. Masking, you know, offers protection. Uh, you know, in the best studies, 10 to 20 percent reduction in COVID transmission, which is good. But I think you have to recognize that a, a university campus is no different than day-to-day -day life in many settings where masking is not provided. B, students in university don't necessarily just sit in the classroom all day. They eat together, they live together, they go to bars together, they study together, their environments together all the time that are in their privacy where masking isn't used. And so, you know, is that risk going to be significantly reduced by masking only in the classroom versus, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, when people go back to their day to day lives, um, that's, uh, you know, masking comes off or is optional. And I think, you know, again, we have to give students the right to have a normal year. People want to interact. It's a social experience to be in university. If people want a mask, they should wear a mask. They should wear a well-constructed, well-fitted mask. Uh, and again, we have to be sure that in all settings, we are not discriminating against people based on their mask choices, that they, if they want to wear a mask, they should have the freedom and the availability to wear a mask without any type of discrimination. Dr. Chagla, we have just about a minute left. I, I want to slightly switch topics, but still about uh, about COVID. I know you do a lot of research. You you pay attention to a lot of the information that's coming out. Uh, from your perspective, do we have a good sense of what this pandemic is going to look like in the fall? Look, this pandemic is still affecting people that are immunocompromised and elderly. And, and we really want to make sure those people are protected going into the fall. They need to be fully vaccinated. They need to be accessing treatments when the time comes, if the time comes that they get COVID, they need to be offered all the protections possible in that spot. We probably will see a rise in transmission. What that means from a healthcare standpoint is unclear. But again, you know, I, I think we have to focus on the groups where the disease is affecting the most and offer them the most protections rather than worrying about, you know, lower level things like university institutions. I don't have to tell you a lot of emotional reactions to these topics, and you've uh, decided that uh, you, you do want to kind of weigh in on this, and we appreciate you taking the time to explain your uh, view on, on these issues. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks, Ian. After the break, movie theaters are being forced to rethink what they can offer you. Most of our programming now isn't film at all. Um, it's uh, live performance, it's rentals. The steps many are taking to get you back in their seats. But first, on the eve of the historic lunar launch, we revisit my conversation with a Canadian astronaut about her own historic space flight. I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're just hours away now from an important rocket launch. NASA's Artemis One is poised to usher in a new era of space exploration, building on decades of scientific contributions, including from many Canadians. And one of them, Canada's first female astronaut, Dr. Roberta Bondar. I spoke with her earlier in the year on the 30th anniversary of her shuttle mission. Dr. Bonder, it's a real privilege uh, to speak to you. Welcome. Thank you for having me here. I want to go back to that day, 30 years ago tomorrow. You're strapped into 
the shuttle and about to do science experiments in space. So in a lot of ways, maybe the greatest scientific challenge of your storied career. But I think it's worth reminding people who are watching the, the potential danger that you and astronauts faced. The, the, the Challenger uh, disaster had happened just, what, uh, six years earlier. There would be another shuttle disaster about a decade later. Tell us about kind of the courage, the valor Three, that all of you two, needed to have one, as you got ready zero, for that launch. Zero. And lift off, lift off of the space shuttle Discovery. It's very true. I mean, it's always said that the most dangerous part of space flight are the launch, the landing, and everything in between. And after a while, one gets used to figuring out what the risk is that you want to accept that morning or that afternoon and just getting on with it because it's a professional job and we just want to do it well. Uh, not to dwell on it, though, but but you had to. Uh, was it a video message to to your to your mother where you had to contemplate her seeing this in the worst possible circumstances? Three hours before I was supposed to get up in the morning to go onto the shuttle, I decided I'd leave an audio tape for my for my mother, and it's never been played. It's never been played since my flight. I still have it, and I think someday I might listen to it. Uh, but I, I don't know what was wrong with me. I thought, well, I better li leave some kind of voice to say, it's okay, Mom, this is what I want to do. And I had to shut the tape off all the time because I was you know, tearing up. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think all of this is, is, is a peek inside a time when, you know, the, the immense challenges that, that you and other astronauts faced. And now we live in a time where if you're rich enough, you can go to space. This era of space tourism, I, I, I'm really curious, what do you think of that? I think well, space tourism has been going on for a while. The Russians have extracted a lot of money. Uh, I, mean, I think about Madame Ansari that went up into space. So they used Mir and the International Space Station for, for people who were not professionally trained astronauts to fly. Uh, um, and, you know, you can't tell somebody how to use their money. I mean, you really, you can suggest and ethically hope they will do it. But if billionaires have the money to construct a toy that they want to go into space with, one can only hope that there's some spinoffs from some of the information that we get from technology. But no one likes to see these kinds of things built into wildlife preserves or encroaching on habitat that, that needs to be used in an ethical manner differently. So I think those are, there are, there are conflicts about that. It's, it's tough, I think, for a professional astronaut, uh, myself included, to be able to watch somebody go up for 25 seconds and not look at the earth, but choose to play with some smarties. <laughs> Let's put your impact as an astronaut in perspective. We went to three other Canadian astronauts and asked them to, to talk about you, and let, let's play that tape now. Roberta Bondar's contribution to space travel has been to open the door and the dreams for so many others, to take a huge personal risk to do something so that others could follow in her footsteps and to show us the world in a way that we'd never seen it before. Thanks and respect, Roberta. Roberta's impact on space travel has been that of a pioneer. She blazed the trail for the many scientists, physicians, women, and Canadians who followed her. Then in the past 30 years, she has very creatively used this mission experience, as well as her photography and her foundation to help us all better appreciate the planet's environment. Congratulations, Roberta. Hi, Roberta. This is Jenny Seide Gibbons from the Canadian Space Agency, and I just want to say congratulations on the 30th anniversary of your space flight. I also want to take this opportunity to say thank you for inspiring me and countless other Canadians around the world throughout your careers in neuroscience, space, and conservation since your space flight. I just think we are so fortunate to have you to look up to, to hear from. You're very generous with your experiences and we're just so lucky to have you. So thank you so much and enjoy all of the joy that today brings. I hope it's truly a wonderful celebration. I loved watching your face as you listened to those, those tributes to Canadians who have been in space, the third waiting for her assignment. Your reaction to, to what they were saying? Well, it's very generous. It's uh, it's also good that we're all still alive <laughs> and look pretty good still. You know, uh, no, it's very it's very nice for people to take the time to to mark this anniversary. Uh, I, I just think it's it's just a, a wonderful sense of respect for what it is we do, and especially seeing Jenny. 
uh, on the screen because I know she's a new mom and she is working very, very hard and training very hard. And she's the next woman, hopefully, will be flying in space. Uh, certainly, Bob Thursk has... Uh, has done a lot being on space station, uh, being in the shuttle. And of course, Chris Hadfield has been remarkable in his spacewalks and in the work that he's done uh, since his space flight. So it was all very, very generous of them. Dr. Bonder, I, I know this is a, a big question, but, but what do you hope your legacy will be? Well, I hope my legacy will be about a person who tried, a person who was able to move the bar, especially for humankind. I think that for Canadian women, it's good to have role models, regardless of what field it's in. But I think mainly I like people to look at me as a person who has a high degree of ethics and was trying to do something to share her vision of the earth and space and how special it is help other people engage with the natural world. It was so impressive reading about you getting ready for this interview. I certainly have followed you in the news, but I, I'd kind of forgotten how many areas you are so accomplished in from medicine to, uh, to, to photography, for example. And it's a real privilege talking to you today. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. For many people, watching a movie in a crowded theater is still a distant pre-pandemic memory. As film audiences move from cinemas to streaming, there's a push in the movie theater industry to diversify to survive. Lisa Shing shows us how. I was five and These days, Paradise Theater is a different kind of venue than it was when it started out a few years ago. Film programming at the time was probably 70 to 80 percent. That's all changed. We do comedy. We do music shows or, or other sort of events. How crucial has that been? <laughs> very, very crucial. And that's honestly, most of our programming now isn't film at all. Um, it's uh, live performance, it's rentals. The pandemic has changed everything, shuttering cinemas, keeping crowds home. Even though Canadian chain Cineplex reported its strongest quarter in more than two years earlier this month, crediting blockbusters like Top Gun Maverick and Jurassic World, it's offering two-for-one ticket deals and a members club to keep people coming back. Other chains like Landmark are touting heated reclining seats. That's what we're competing with, is getting people back into that habit. I mean, over the last two and a half years, there are certainly many customers that have lost the habit. Even though some theater chains are reporting strong results, analysts say the industry is undergoing a huge shift. Streaming will only become a bigger part of how people get their entertainment. According to recent data, by next year, the number of households with streaming services is projected to more than double from 2017. It's expected many will be subscribed to more than one service. And even if services like Disney Plus aren't profitable now, they will be. The studios are playing a long game. And the long game is we need to have a direct connection into the consumer. So how do cinemas survive? It is key to reflect on the sort of um, not to put all your eggs in one basket type um, adage, because I think that uh, there's still never going to be enough major blockbuster releases for this to sort of hold. It also means a leaner theatre industry in the future. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. Nazem Kadri took the Stanley Cup to a place it's never been before. It's just part of my background, it's part of my roots, it's part of who I am. He shares his victory with his community in our moment. Two months ago, Nazem Kadri won the Stanley Cup as a member of the Colorado Avalanche. He's believed to be the first Muslim to become an NHL champion. And this weekend, he returned to his hometown of London, Ontario, and one of the places he took the cup was his local mosque. Their celebration is our moment. Kadri! I'm very appreciative, very privileged and honored to be the first ever Muslim to bring the Stanley Cup to the mosque. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Well, I think, uh, you know, it's important to share with our community and you know, obviously with our uh, background, I think it's uh, it's important. And obviously, you know, to be the first one to do anything is, is quite an ach achievement and uh, an honor for myself and my family. If he did it, why can't I? It's one person did it, that opens the door for everyone else. 
It just shows like if I put my uh, mind to it, I can also do it. Like maybe one day I'll be bringing the Stanley Cup back to London, hopefully. It's just part of my background. It's part of my roots. It's part of who I am. So, uh, you know, I, this, there's a reason why I brought it out and just kind of showcased it because, you know, I think the community deserves it. And uh, they've been cheering me on from the start. So I wanted to share that with everybody. You know, lots of hockey players talk about that moment. It might be at a camp, it might be watching a game, or it might be at that mosque where an already good player just gets inspired to be that much better. And it'll be interesting. Like, look at the faces, how happy people were. It'll be interesting to see if that happens there. Kadri has a connection to a lot of cities, right? London, Ontario, Toronto, where he played for the Leafs, Calgary, where he just signed. I'm going to talk to him next week, I guess, in an interview that will be on The National in a couple of weeks' time. That is the program for August 28th. Good night.